the School of Architecture, both registered architects who co-founded the firm R.E.D. in 2004. R.E.D., and this will be the first of many initials in this introduction, partially because they, their CVs are full of initials and because it allows me not to pronounce big words that I can't pronounce, uh, is an award-winning research and design studio based in Barcelona and Porto, dedicated to exploring the new design possibilities that emerge from the implementation of advanced digital design technologies. So to begin with the initials, Pedro graduated from FAUP, Porto, and holds a master's in genetic architectures from ESARQ hyphen UIC, no relation to RUIC, in Barcelona, and is a PhD candidate in engineering sciences at IST hyphen UTL, Lisbon, with a scholarship from FCT. Uh, Marta, or MNA, has a diploma from ETSAV hyphen UPC, Barcelona, an MSADD from Columbia University, uh, is completing a PhD at ETSAB hyphen UPC, Barcelona, and has taught at UPenn, SIRC, and UCLA, all US. Um, both Pedro and Marta are currently teaching in the Digital Tectonics Postgraduate Program at the IAAC, I'll try that one, Institute for Advanced Architecture in Catalonia, where Marta is also currently Director of Digital Technology. And in order to produce a whole generation of new baby initials, we're actually trying to hook up IAAC and UIC in the near future, we'll make lots of little initials. Um, in fact, currently our third year undergrad traveling studio in Barcelona is going to be doing a workshop there in a couple of weeks. And we hope to extend that next year for the grads. The work of R&D has appeared in AA Files, Icon, Frame, Quadens, Verb, Flong, Surface, Architeze, among others, and has been exhibited recently at the Venice Biennale, the Lisbon Triennale, uh, and most locally, here's another initials, at NMFX, which is Manufacturing Material Effects in the, uh, at the Indianapolis Museum of Art. What distinguishes the work of Marta and Pedro is that it falls between two frequent extremes of digitally informed work. In other words, design work that's less concerned with its physical and material realization on the one hand, or on the other, scientifically driven parametric fabrication that has little to recommend it in terms of its actual design. Um, RAD uses advanced technology, whether for their own projects or in collaboration, uh, always as a way to specify and advance a larger design ambition, which is another way of saying that they are designers by desire and nerds by necessity. So please join me in welcoming Pedro and Marta to Chicago, the coolest and most fashionable nerds I know, uh, with hopes that they come back very often. Thank you. Let's say it's 
we live in a, in a moment where we, we find computing technologies interfere in any moment of the architectural process. From the, let's say, we can, we can look into the history of this, uh, the integration of this technology in architecture, and today, current technologies allow architects to increase efficiency in the production of 2D drawings, for example, like in, in the early 80s or end of the 70s. It allows us to communicate our projects in uh, alternative ways than using analog uh, models, uh, using 3D rendering software, for example. It uh, allows us also to think our design projects in different ways uh, by exploring certain kind of techniques uh, and programs like animation, like programming, scripting, etc. Uh, this was something that started to emerge in the, in the beginning of the 90s. And finally, more recently, uh, we can find that computers also help architects to build their projects. And we are interested in this media and in this technology because actually it can interfere and can appear in any moment of our technical projects and therefore we can, let's say, expand, we feel we can expand our uh, creative and material opportunities in, uh, in architecture. So there is this uh, direct interest between uh, our practice and these technologies, but this also stimulates in us a strong or uh, deep reflection about uh, the meaning and about methodologies that can come out of using these technologies. And when we look at this image, the typical image of a craft activity, uh, this, uh, craftsman is working around a piece with his hands, and what is interesting is to realize that uh, in fact there is no disconnection uh, between conception and fabrication in this kind of uh, process, because at the same time he's this man is, uh, let's say, fabricating this ceramic uh, element, he actually can decide and interfere in the design appearance and in the aesthetics of this piece. So, uh, fabrication informs design and design informs fabrication. This kind of interactive relationship is something that we uh, find interesting and possible when using digital technologies. The image on the right shows a milling machine uh, using uh, the, on the left using uh, this milling machine is being driven by a digital surface and uh, by selecting different machining parameters this machine can produce a smooth surface or a textured one so in a similar fashion we think that if we are involved in fabrication uh, in the fabrication process although we are using digital technologies we can start to explore a similar kind of experience and integration between design and fabrication. And this is something that is uh, important to, uh, in, our, in our work. So basically this diagram shows uh, a little bit about methodologies that can come out of, of using these technologies. We can find digital technologies to perform uh, traditional uh, processes, stages in the architectural process, like design, like engineering, like fabrication. Again, we are here a couple of more initials. Uh, and uh, by commuting between them in a non-linear way, we can influence uh, the development of our designs, taking influence from uh, ideas, from the development of our projects, or by material testing, for example. Uh, very quickly, CAE is Computer Edit Engineering Technology, so for analysis, uh, CAD, Computer Edit Design, and CAN, Computer Edit Manufacturing Technologies for fabrication. So we are showing now, because as I, as I told in the beginning, we try to merge research and, and design in our practice. We are showing a couple of projects in the research part, uh, where three main uh, themes uh, are recurrent or are repetitive in our uh, work. There is an interest in geometry, there is an interest in structure and assemblies and in material. And we try to understand how computing technologies allow us to expand our possibilities in these three uh, aspects. So, in terms of geometry, for example, uh, we have been doing several courses where with the students, uh, we try to understand how curved uh, 
the geometries can actually be uh, described in the computer, can be fabricated and assembled uh, to create uh, non-regular or non-flat surfaces, which is always a challenge uh, in architecture. So this is a workshop uh, in Portugal done recently with, uh, with students with no experience with, with fabrication, but where there is uh, control by the help of computers to quickly uh, design and explain and fabricate a, a material uh, model uh, using these processes. But of course these, these shapes uh, in architecture usually are very big. They cannot be built using a single material or a single component. So we had to research uh, processes of subdivision, processes of assembly, uh, and we go to the field of structure and uh, assemblies. This was a seminar done, done at UPenn, uh, where triangulated processes were studied to describe uh, variable curved surfaces like these ones. Uh, using parametric uh, modeling techniques, uh, the students developed uh, uh, digital models made out of variable components. So there is a, what we see here is a single component that varies in size depending on its position on this curved uh, shape. So by using this kind of technique, one can actually change the parameters that drive the, the general surface and automatically each one of these components is updated to the specific and right uh, dimensions to perform or to build uh, a material structure. This was done with laser cutting and folding techniques with, uh, with cardboard. And we have here four examples of these uh, digital material uh, connections. Uh, exploring the same kind of uh, problems but using a different technique. Here we were working with programming with Autolisk language in a workshop done at, at Sire where the students again were exploring the generation of the description of uh, pure surfaces uh, built with variable components. So by, by writing small scripts, the students were able to describe each one of these uh, uh, components automatically, to label each one of them uh, and to produce the 2D contours to be ready to cut them with a laser cut and to fold and assemble uh, to produce the corresponding material uh, model. So this, this experience between digital and material is crucial for us as, as explained in the, in the previous images and is also behind the title of this lecture, the computational material. Um, another big field of research uh, that we somehow do is actually to work uh, purely material research uh, using digital technologies. This is part of Pedro's PhD at PST, that is the, Insti the Instituto Superior Tecnico in Lisbon, um, where he's actually uh, rethinking the application of cork uh, in, in, in terms of producing building com build variable building components of cork. Uh, this is part early studies of his uh, material research uh, that he's pursuing at the moment. Um, this is also another experience that, um, that was carried out at IAC. Um, we were working in collaboration with a company that does uh, um, parts for chairs uh, made out of recycled plastic. And so here the, the idea was that we would get a whole bunch of standard parts that were these chair parts and we would use digital technologies to, or CNC fabrication technologies to de-standardize in a way the, what were otherwise completely standard components. And the idea was to somehow be able to, at the end, assemble the parts with one another and create a larger surface uh, made out of these parts. Uh, here the, the problem appears to be very simple, but in fact, because these chairs had double cur were double curved, in fact it was quite difficult to study the contours and, and somehow control the assemblies of one piece with the other now that they were no longer standard parts. Um, uh, similarly, we have entered a couple of very small competitions 
for material research, pure material research. This was a competition that we won uh, and that was um, uh, proposed by a company that is doing ceramic uh, panels. And they were basically asking architects to think uh, new ways of, uh, of using this material and especially new techniques that could actually be uh, applied for that. We basically did a very, very simple project. This project was supposed to be installed at the Lisbon airport and we did a kind of assemble box with all the colors of their, of their, uh, of their ceramics. And what we studied was basically how to cut differential contours in the ceramics using laser cutting, uh, water jet uh, cutting techniques. This is a little bit our uh, idea of being able to assemble all those parts uh, together. So there were basically only ceramic parts uh, making this, this whole box, and except for the bottom topography uh, that would be made out of MDF. Uh, this was a little bit the idea that we would sample all the colors that they have with uh, differential contours. And these are a uh, few images of the prototyping that we did, the base, uh, the MDF base all produced uh, on this side. And, and here the beginning of uh, cutting the ceramic parts and putting them together. And this is the final thing at the Lisbon airport and some shots of the, of the color uh, plates assembled together. This is a view towards the topographic surface at the bottom and some images of the passageways that you have through the color uh, panels. For the same company, we also entered uh, another entry uh, that that was uh, called flying carpet, and in this one, what we tried to explore was basically to create a totally regular surface that we would do, that we would produce both structure and skin made out of ceramics. And here, what we were actually studying was the possibility, considering that ceramics would be a very heavy material, that when the surface would actually take off from the ground, that we would be somehow producing. Uh, openings on the surface so that we would lighten uh, its weight. Uh, the idea was here to somehow, considering that this was installed at the airport, that and there was all this idea about the flying part, uh, we, did, we reproduced using the colors uh, of the ceramics that you saw in the previous project, we reproduced an image, and somehow this is now, right now, is actually in prototyping and we will get it done for uh, Frankfurt Fair this week, uh, this uh, year. And this is uh, actually uh, some of the models that we produced for that, where here uh, there is absolutely no glue between the parts, all the parts are somehow um, studied, the geometry of the parts is studied so that they are assembled to one another uh, directly. These are some of the shots of this. And what we're thinking about is actually that this is only a, a, a microscopic, in a way, very small prototype for something that could become much, much larger, much more like building systems for facades, making facades out of ceramics and colors. That's on. So this is where we are actually hoping to go with the, with the company. So now moving to the, to the design practice. To real conditions and uh, problems, economical problems, etc. Uh, we will show uh, some of, of our projects that we did. Some of them are projects that are uh, collaborations with other architects and uh, industrial companies. Uh, other projects are independent projects uh, done by ourselves for private clients and for uh, institutional. Uh, clients. Uh, we'll start with the, with the collaborations. This was uh, this is Shuret's system, and it was a collaboration between uh, us, uh, the architects from Madrid, Madrid uh, Abel Zerreiro, and the concrete company from Barcelona called Escofet. Uh, the story of this project is uh, quickly. Uh, this was uh, an invitation uh, for Abel Zerreiro to draw a bench 
for the Forum 2004 event in uh, Barcelona. Uh, and, the Abel, and the Escofet company was supposed to build those benches uh, in concrete. Uh, this render that you see here on the left uh, was the, the idea uh, as described by Abel Zierherer. So we got these digital renders uh, with, a very, with a bench with a very strange uh, shape and irregular one. So when the concrete company took this or uh, took a look onto these drawings, they started to think how they could build it uh, using their traditional methods. And they quickly they realized that uh, they would need the help of uh, some uh, more recent technologies to help them using the information uh, done by the architects to, to help them to manufacture these, these benches. And so we enter in this project to mediate the architects that had the idea and the concrete company that would build the, the benches. And we were supposed to implement a digital CAD CAM process uh, to take the digital information by the architects. Uh, and we had to revise all the geometry of, the, of this bench in order to prepare it to be uh, ready to guide CNC, uh, computer numerical control machines, uh, to fabricate the molds for this, uh, for this bench. Uh, basically, this bench is made out of uh, five parts, and these parts can be combined in many different ways to create different uh, groups uh, of benches. Uh, to, to assure the right, the right connection between these parts, each curvature must arrive into the joint tangent in order to be able to continue smoothly to the next uh, part. So this was the first problem that we had to, to, to solve in the beginning, to revise the overall geometry of the bench. Uh, but the architects had a second idea about this project. They wanted the surface uh, to be a three-dimensional surface, let's say, inspired by this image of, the, of a plan with the fans, they wanted the bench to show some emergent kind of veins along the, the vehicle surface. So what we had to do was to find a process to actually create this 3D digital information. Uh, we developed a, a parametric model of 2D curves that we were able to adjust and test different configurations. And these 2D curves were then mapped in the, in the 3 digital surface, not mapped as usually in render softwares as images, but mapped as vectors in space. Because they were vectors, we were able to extrude uh, circles along these lines, uh, and therefore, uh, in this way, we were able to produce these tubes that were emerging out of the overall surface. So this was the trick to produce the 3D digital information with all the detail necessary to, to go to the CNC fabrication. Uh, before it, we tested in the computer the different, uh, different configurations of the, of the bench to see if all these lines were continuing from one piece to the other and to test with the geometry. Uh, and because this was the first time that the concrete company was exploring these technologies, uh, they wanted to build first uh, a prototype in styrofoam uh, using this, uh, this technique. So in more or less 3-4 days uh, we built a rough prototype at 1 to 1 scale of the whole bench. The top part was milled smoothly uh, according to the surface of the bench while the bottom part was roughly produced by using contours to extract uh, from the overall geometry to, to make the process more quick, quicker. Uh, when this, uh, this prototype was produced, everybody, both architects, concrete company and ourselves, felt comfortable to go ahead with the production of the final positives for the company to produce the mold. Uh, this, in this case, we had to use a 5-axis milling machine to be able to mill the, the bench in one single uh, operation uh, and here we were using a different material, we were using uh, high density uh, polyurethane foam 
in order to describe very precisely the, all these banks in the surface. So here we were like having a look at the final result. And with these elements, the, the concrete company was able to start the mass production of, of these benches. Uh, the appearance of these benches changed because they try different pigmentations. So the bench uh, uh, appears in yellow, grey and uh, red color. Uh, and uh, they, as they are done in, in concrete, they are very heavy uh, elements so that they could put them in the, in the gardens and nobody could take them out of the garden. You know? So this, this question of the heaviness of the bench was a very interesting thing for us because uh, immediately by feeling the, the, these benches uh, fabricated, uh, we were easily transported to think that in using the same process but to produce other things. So here, this was a project of human furniture, but because of the size of these elements and the, the weight of these elements, we started to think that this process could be applied also, for example, to produce concrete panels or building facades. So this experience actually uh, made us think uh, wider than this simple uh, project of, of human furniture. And as you can see here, Let's say all these lines continue from one piece to the other and the tangent condition between the elements allows us to uh, combine any of these five pieces in the order that we, we wish. Uh, in the same kind of uh, works of collaborations we did uh, other works. This was one done for architects called Habitat Actual from Barcelona that they were doing in the renovation of a medical center and they asked us to uh, design uh, this uh, acrylic wall that was dividing the waiting area from the doors to enter in the doctor's office. So this is a, a variable wall made with acrylic panels and we developed a texture that was milled directly in the, in the acrylic panels to produce a continuous the texture from one panel to, to the other. Another example of, of uh, collaboration was done last year with this uh, theater company called La Fura del Sbaos uh, for a, a project, for a, a show that uh, they started in May last year called Imperium and we were asked that they wanted to build a structure like a pyramid but this pyramid was supposed to be able to change its configuration in order to support the different uh, phases of the of the show, so sometimes these uh, these elements here were folded down, and we you couldn't see or perceive the pyramid. But then these elements could let's say change position. We could combine all these units between them to create different uh, scenarios and conditions to support the the show. So here we enter to. Think, to help them thinking in this structure and to, to design and fabricate them. Uh, another kind of uh, projects that we do, uh, besides the collaborations with architects and, and industrial companies and so on, are obviously private commissions. Um, so this is the case of uh, Morslight, uh, this apartment renovation that we did in Barcelona. We were basically asked to renovate a very, very small apartment. Uh, that is basically, this was the existing plan. Uh, what was happening was basically that you would enter in the apartment and you would be in this corridor with doors on the right and on the left. Finally, you would get to turn the corner of the corridor to get to a very small living room and here there was a kitchen with a dining room and so on. So what we proposed, obviously we could not make the apartment larger, but what we proposed was, first of all, we would demolish the dining room and connect it together with the, with the living room, but also we would treat uh, the whole corridor and living room, we would treat it in, in a kind of continuous manner, and we would do so by wrapping also the kitchen and bathrooms 
together with a kind of continuous skin. So this would this object, this would uh, begin to read as an object that was actually uh, located in, in in this kind of continuous space. Also, we we moved uh, one of the doors uh, of one of the rooms. We actually moved it from here to here so that we could have a bookshelf with books, so that somehow the, the corridor would disappear or would be now activated by the fact that there was this uh, bookshelf in the middle. Uh, here the problem was kind of, when we, when we were dealing with how to produce this continuous skin for the box, um, then in a way, uh, one of the decisions was, uh, let's treat, uh, let's replace all the doors on this side of the corridor for sliding doors, so that they will be part of this continuous skin. And now the problem is a little bit more, let's say, complex than the bench because in the bench, for instance, we had five cards that could be combined with one another but in fixed positions. While in here now with the sliding doors, the doors could be positioned in any place and we would somehow want to be able to read that continuity of the, of the texture or whatever we would do on the surface of the box. So after much tries and much trying and much thinking, we came up with this solution that we would actually use Morse code text uh, to produce the, the decoration, if you want, of that of that surface of the box. Because in the Morse code, in the Morse code the text, you can basically take a piece of it and and move it uh, and. Eventually, to your eye, you, you might you know, never see the, the difference between one thing and the other. Obviously, the meaning of the text is different, but otherwise, in terms of pattern and, and visual effect, it is, is actually uh, remains continuous even though it's actually variable. So what we did, we did a whole bunch of studies about how we could use this graphic device into somehow manipulating a three-dimensional surface. Uh, with different degrees of, of uh, resolution, if you want. And at the end, we, we, we uh, decided that we were going to use a kind of almost very faceted surface so that, in a way, the, the, the specifics of the Morse code text would, would somehow disappear in a kind of irregular kind of surface. Uh, here, this is maybe the, the project that best uh, describes or best illustrates the idea that Pedro was talking about at the beginning of the ceramic, uh, of the idea of the ceramic uh, craftsman uh, being able to design and fabricate at the same time. Because here, once we had the three dimensional surface that we were going to use, we actually began to do a whole bunch of tests of how to manipulate the, the parameters at the CNC, at the milling machine, so that we could actually achieve different effects. And these effects that you see here are actually results of altering those parameters rather than a different design surface in the first place. So a lot, a lot happened, in fact. A lot of decisions were taken at the fabrication level. And obviously one of the most important parts for us was how are we going to go from one plane into the other in the corner of the box? And we wanted that texture to be totally continuous and not stop uh, at the edge of the box. Uh, here we are fabricating all those panels uh, and actually uh, also uh, being part of the installation team in the apartment where the carpenters actually only came to help out at the very last moment, otherwise we did everything in-house. And here is a little bit the demonstration that what we were talking about before about this Morse code text, about the fact that when you move one of these sliding doors, eventually you, you perceive that, that uh, texture, you perceive it still in, in a kind of continuity, even though sometimes you have these continuous events happening, but nonetheless, most of the times you read it as something continuous. Um, this is the, the more slight panels installed in the apartment. This is what now you see from the entrance. The corridor is now, uh, you basically pass between this box and the bookshelf that is there. And very important for us is this detail of the corner of the box where you see the, the texture uh, being uh, 
uh, somehow turning the corner, now the corner is all eroded, and somehow this, the line of the edge now has disappeared in the, in the texture. Um, that's, that's how it feels when you go through. You arrive now at the dining room, oops, dining room, living room that is now all connected. Uh, this is looking back towards the dining room. Now here, behind this uh, surface, we have the kitchen and the two bathrooms. Uh, that's when you basically open the sliding doors. Uh, they are still there as they were before. Uh, and here we are. Uh, facing now the other way of, of the apartment towards the entrance. Uh, we also do a lot of other design projects. We've shown maybe the one that best represented this idea of computation and materiality. But for instance, this is a house that is under construction in Porto, in uh, Gondomar, next to Porto in Portugal, uh, that will soon be completed. And inside of that house, we are doing uh, a kind of very large uh, shelf that is more like a kind of installation because it will basically occupy a double height space that is in the middle of that house and will somehow ex uh, yeah, uh, get out of the house or exit the house through a kind of uh, uh, skylight that is also in, the, in this double, uh, double height space. And, and now the geometry of this of this shelf is actually uh, being studied because there is a kind of elevator in here that there will be a kind of elevated platform and, and basically its geometry is studied so that it doesn't interfere with the movement around it. Well, going uh, for another kind of, of clients, uh, we did an exhibition in the Constals in Grass for the museum. Uh, and uh, when we were we were asked to, to design uh, an installation to support an exhibition about this about the theme of the cities, it was called M City, and it was dedicated to show works of art uh, about uh, six six different cities uh, selected in uh, in Europe. Uh, for us, this was a challenge. This exhibition. Uh, by one hand, due to the, to the scale of it, there were about 30 artists showing uh, many different kinds of works of art, from paintings, photographs, models, uh, video installations. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, we were challenged by having to do something inside of this uh, building uh, designed by Peter Cook and California. Uh, for us, it was the first time that we entered to, to this building, it was like a shock to perceive that from the outside this building was uh, uh, curved, very smooth, blue, shiny, uh, with all these lights. Uh, and on the inside, it was like the opposite. What was acrylic became uh, metal, the blue became gray, uh, natural light became artificial light, so it was like very uh, shocking. Uh, Feeling. Uh, and when we visit the interior, we found these two. There, there are two uh, levels. Uh, on the left side is the is the first level, which is uh, a little bit strange because we have all this curve element. And then the first floor art is like two cuts on this curve shape, and we have a homogeneous space in terms of height with all these 600 uh, fluorescent lights placed in a regular grid. Uh, on the second level, uh, here, uh, finally, we started to perceive the curvature of this building, uh, where walls and ceiling were a continuous kind of surface, uh, and this surface was populated with these skylights that were bringing artificial light to the, to the interior. So when we were thinking about uh, ideas, about uh, how to develop our project, uh, we ended up uh, by being inspired by the conditions of the light in both floors to generate or to help them thinking, help us thinking in, a, in our solution. So basically this render shows the two uh, installations that we developed here. Full escape on the first floor consists in a kind of an inverted topography that is suspended 
from the fluorescent lights in the city. And in the, in the second floor, we have complex installation, which is a set of six cones that are suspended also from the lights uh, in, the, in the skylights of the, of the city. So we'll start to, to show the, the installation in the first floor. Uh, as we saw before, this is the, what we get when we, we are in this, in this floor. We have all these lights, and our idea was to take these lights and to produce something that could vary, something that could bring some of the curvature that one could perceive from the exterior into this floor where we almost don't see any uh, curvature. Uh, our first intention was to uh, take each one of these lights and to lower down individually in, in uh, different uh, heights. Uh, but in that case we had to build like metal supporters for each one of the lights and it could be, like, let's say, very difficult to do it and uh, for sure we, we wouldn't have the support of the electrician of the constals to help us doing this kind of installation. So we thought in doing the opposite, to keep the lights in the ceiling but to suspend uh, an element with different lengths from each one of the lights. So we thought about fabrics, we thought about transparency kind of conditions, uh, but it should be something easy in order to be able to manage all these uh, amount of variable uh, elements. Uh, in order to design and to fabricate this, uh, this structure, this installation, uh, we looked into several digital design techniques to be able to model a non-regular uh, curved surface. We found very easy to model it in many softwares, but because we were forced to change our uh, solution through the time, uh, we had to look into a flexible method that allowed us to design this curved surface, but then allowed us to change it uh, in an easy way. Because for us, let's say, this idea of putting a curved topography in the ceiling, we didn't want it to be a random topography. We, want, we wanted this topography to respond to the organization of the works of art in the, uh, displaced in the, placed in the ground. So when we look at this plan, what we see is are the six different thematic areas. Uh, and from each one of these areas, we can identify the center, the geometric center of each one, and by exploring scripting uh, processes, we build a program that was able to take the floor, the, the ceiling plan of the fluorescent lights, and then by calculating the distance of each one of the lights to the centers of the thematic areas, the program automatically uh, attributes or creates a specific length for this piece of fabric that we wanted to suspend. So there was a, a, an easy uh, or simple mathematical relationship that we found to describe this curvature. And then we found that implementing it in a scripting would give us the necessary uh, flexibility to produce changes along the process. And these changes were coming because uh, the curator was always changing the, the, the words of art that the museum could have, or, or that it was always changing the, the works of art to be uh, shown in, in the exhibition. And so the boundaries of each one of these areas was always changing through the process. With the scripting, we could easily change the conditions, the boundary conditions, the center, and uh, automatically produce, as we saw in this uh, quick video, 3D digital models of the topography, uh, flat versions of the contours of each one of the 600 different uh, fabrics placed in the ground, ready to be cut, uh, and also the script was able to label each one individually. And uh, a final feature was that by using scripting, we could easily add new features to the program. One of them that we had was the calculation of the area of the material. So at the end of, it, of uh, running the, the, the script, uh, in the, in the, of, of running each time the script, we get the final uh, value of the area of material that we have, so we can also estimate the, um, the costs of, of our installation. And cost could also be 
an influence about the final and overall shape of, the, of our solution. So these are some images taken uh, from the script, the three digital model, the labels of each one of the flags, the flattening versions of each one of the contours. In this image you can you perceive the you can see the label of, of the flag, the number 425, and also the area of each flag. And uh, to select the specific fabric that we wanted to use, we did some testing in the constant to see the transparency and opaque conditions that one could get out of this installation. We ended up going to a fabric called uh, Twal, uh, which is a translucent kind of fabric, and uh, this was cut in Germany using uh, a very large uh, CNC cutting laser cut machine that usually was used by this company to cut uh, boat sails and in this case, using this machine, in two days they were able to cut all the 600 different flags. Uh, in the constals they were assembled uh, with the help of the, the unique uh, printed document that we did that was a map uh, showing in the ceiling each one of the, the numbers of these fabrics to be assembled in the right position. And this is the, the final uh, installation. This is the, let's say, the, what we can see when we look directly into the ceiling. Uh, we see total transparency to the ceiling. But when we are actually going or visiting the exhibition, we start to perceive different kind of uh, transparent and opaque uh, conditions. For example, here one can realize the topography that were created by the script involving a specific thematic area. Again, another one over the landscape uh, show. But when we look in this direction, for example, one perceives transparency. So the, the effect is always changing when one moves uh, through the space. Um, and these two images show. <coughs> and this is the, the ramp escalator that takes the visitor to the, to the second level, where we do the other installation that so the, on the second floor of Kuhn's house, uh, the same way that we were given instructions on the first floor to somehow organize the work of 30 different artists, on the second floor we were given instructions that we would need to produce six projection rooms because uh, the, exhibi the exhibition curator wanted to show six movies on six different cities. So, Looking at this space, we were given very specific instructions about the fact that they should be completely closed and completely dark. But when we looked at that space and the fact that it was maybe the only place in the whole building in which we could see finally the continuity between the wall and the ceiling uh, and the kind of curvature of the, of the envelope, uh, it would be actually a shame to now begin to divide the space with walls and creating six containers in a way that would again subdivide the space. So what we proposed was to somehow um, create a series of uh, cones in a way that would be suspended from, from the ceiling again, uh, coming out from the skylights of the of the space and 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 basically uh, using parametric design concepts as well, we, 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 made, it in, we made those cones in such a way that uh, they would all have the same, uh, exact same dimensions for their structural rings, but nonetheless the, the relative position of those rings would be different for each one of the cones and we would as well uh, somehow locate them at different heights so that we could absorb the curvature of the city. This, is, this was the supposed, supposed to be, this was the image that was supposed to be here. And here you see, uh, here you see the six, six different cones and the relative position of their rings and plan, how it changes, and this is actually our parameter model. This is uh, the model of the, 
the model of the commons now uh, somehow in the in the Kunsthaus house bubble and how it relates to to the building. And here a kind of very important detail is that the lower wing of this commons is actually tilted so that you can enter uh, underneath from uh, from the, its highest point, but also the projection screen is now protected and and somehow uh, uh, yeah, protected by the lower part of the of the cone. And here you see a little bit how we were thinking about how we position those cones uh, with their uh, highest and lower points, and we did so in a, we did so in, in a way that. Uh, basically, all the projection screens would be somehow hidden from the others, so that eventually you would basically move through the space from one cone to the other, and that would the, somehow the position of those cones would as well generate the dynamics for people to move around. And here we are, like in every project, doing a full-scale prototype at one-to-one uh, -one scale. Uh, here at, the, at this uh, German company. Uh, that had this very large laser cutting machine, but also um, CNC bending machine to, to somehow bend the structure of the cones uh, to the right angle. And, and here installing the cones in the cones house, which was actually a very interesting experience because each one of the cones came in fact in a little cardboard box and was deployed in the space, which was for us a real shock because eventually uh, in, in real measurements, the cones have eight, eight meter diameter, and we had always uh, something like this, eventually. Uh, and we were all the time trying to figure out whether or not they would be too large, too small, and so on. And then when they came with this part of the house, was really short. So, in any case, here the cones installed at the cones house, uh, suspended from the ceiling, and Eventually, what we achieved with this was the possibility to create completely dark environments, nonetheless, uh, somehow uh, leaving the, the space continuous and, and being able to see. Uh, for instance, we, we also, uh, in order not to break the continuity of the, of the, of the floor, we, uh, sorry, I'm driving you crazy with the mouse, uh, we actually printed all the information on the cities on the floor. And eventually, that we had only a little bench under the cone so that you could sit down and, and actually see the projection. Here you see how the projection is actually protected by the lower part of the cone and how the projections are actually hidden from one another. And here, the, the, basically, the, the, the possibility to be in a completely dark environment, nonetheless, in a completely open space. And uh, the feeling of looking at the screen. And also what was interesting was that the day of the opening of the show, uh, it was interesting to see that some people actually went under the cones, some people stayed exactly at the edge, while others uh, were staying a little bit more open. Well, here just uh, a couple of images about two other exhibitions that we did. This one called Arita Portugal for the Portuguese Architects Association. And this was supposed to be a traveling exhibition. So our idea was to develop a kind of a solution that could be adapted into different uh, spaces. Basically, this is a very conventional exhibition with photos and uh, 2D drawings. Uh, and to show them, we developed a 100 meter length uh, piece of fabric that could be folded uh, according to the space that we had to, to intervene. Uh, he, this is in the Venice Biennale, in a, in a gallery called Fondaco Marcello, and uh, in this case we follow the structure in the ceiling, these lines, to guide the following process of this fabric. In the second uh, time, in uh, Slovakia, uh, we had a different building, so we adapt our solution to a different configuration, creating a linear trajectory, but also through these uh, openings, some other uh, crossing uh, visiting paths. Finally, this was uh, uh, another traveling exhibition for the Netherlands Architects Institute uh, that was shown in uh, 
Lisbon Triennial Architecture last year. Uh, and the idea was around the, this concept of horror vacui, which basically means the fear of the emptiness. Uh, is a concept that comes from the visual arts, where people try to fill all the gaps in ceramics, in, uh, in uh, paper graphics, uh, with the textures, with motifs, in order to fill the whole space with decoration. In this case, our idea, we had to show a couple of models and uh, photos about the projects in the Netherlands, and we wanted to fill the whole space of the gallery with uh, the installation to produce this kind of sensation. Uh, very shortly, the solution evolved from a basic idea of putting some big blocks of styrofoam or something in, this, in the gallery to create some trajectories here. It is, of course, is a little bit basic and also would be very difficult to travel to other places. But we took this kind of skyscraper uh, landscape to design a linear structure made in aluminium with about 300 meters length that would fold uh, in the space in order to provide the supports for the photos and for the models. So in the end, we end up with, this, uh, with just a single line of aluminium that occupies the whole space, uh, supporting the, the exhibition of the whole, the, all the material of the, of the show, and also supporting, uh, because they are uh, empty in the interior, they are tubes, all the electrical installation also was flowing along these uh, tubes in order to feed these fluorescent lights. So there is only this structure, very economical means in a way, but creating this mass kind of sensation and uh, 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 feeling uh, in the space to show the different projects done in, in Netherlands. And with this uh, project we end up, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. That's a very, very good question. Uh, yes, in this case of the, of the house, the house design project actually is a, it's an old uh, project that started like in 2002. It's still under construction, so it's the... Exactly, for example. Exactly, so let's say it doesn't reflect all our interests or concerns, let's say that uh, now, in 2008, we have. So it's like the true craft kind of work because it's still in construction and because it's still in construction we actually can put our hands a little bit in the way it uh, develops but of course we cannot change everything and we eventually we don't change many things but um, so it actually performs a little bit as you were saying let's say we can we couldn't we were not able to change the overall support 
But because we were now testing certain techniques, we were interested in exploring certain materials, uh, we took advantage of having something in progress to uh, test other things there. Uh, the, the problem or the, the question that you are launching about uh, when we go into another scale of, of project uh, using these, these processes, I think it's like still uh, waiting or cannot be answered yet because by one hand we don't, we don't have yet like a big commission to really test them. But at the same time, let's say we don't feel like pressure uh, about uh, these experiences and how they can be developed in the in the larger scale because uh, when we move uh, into a bigger scale uh, the complexity of, of building construction because it becomes so uh, dense that it's difficult even for big architects with big uh, budgets to design and build uh, for example building totally using digital technology so we in the end, we have to be like prepared to define strategies that negotiate between using advanced technologies, traditional processes, exploring the strange or intricate effects, and other that are more like stable and calm. But I would say that, for example, um, I I would say
I would just say that in fact some of, a lot of the installations that we've been hired to do were in fact traveling exhibitions. And so therefore that's already a kind of conditioning act in a way that it's has it's we try as much as we can to be contextual for each project, but when we we need to anticipate contextuality sometimes because it's going to be a That's, that uh, this kind of confrontation, uh, let's say in this case of the house, it, uh, it was suggested by the language of the house and certain things that we could produce could be interesting to explore this confrontation. But um, let's say the, the solution can change in each, in each situation. It's like uh, building in uh, historical conditions where one could think that the best solution is to build something totally new that by confrontation uh, highlights the existing uh, 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 constructions and on the opposite direction the new building also is highlighted by the situation or one can choose to make something that continues the existing so let's say from our side there's no specific agenda in this kind of confrontations in different scale. At the same, and at the same time, uh, in terms of the techniques that we use, uh, there's a, there is also not specific agenda. So in a way, let's say our intentions or our ideas behind the, the, the project that we do are, the, let's say, the main or the, the guiding force through the rest of the process. And this includes the selection of a digital process or a traditional process to achieve that specific uh, design goal. So in all these projects there is programming, there is run series, there is AutoCAD, there is Photoshop, there is uh, manual aluminum cutting, there is everything uh, just to uh, support the, to reach a specific design goal. It can be consultation, it can be camouflage, it can be it's, uh, many different Situation. So in that case, we are that every project we start uh, thinking it uh, uh, not from zero, no? because there's also there's always a background that we don't like to feel tied to specific design or technical agenda. 